President Trump playing hardball with Iran. In exactly four hours, the White House restarting its crippling sanctions against the rogue nation. And the president has a warning for any other nation that might want to stand in his way. You will, quote, risk severe consequences. As you recall, the administration pulled out of the Iran nuclear deal three months ago. President Trump has been railing against the Obama-era policy since he was a candidate, calling it a horrible one-sided deal. The new sanctions are reportedly meant to gouge Iran's already wounded economy and isolate them from the rest of the world. They won't be able to use U.S. dollars for anything. That's no fun. And they won't be able to import metals. And they won't be able to export many of their own products, which cuts off their ability to raise quick cash. Today on Fox News, National Security Advisor John Bolton explained why the administration is doing this. Well, our policy is not regime change, but we want to put unprecedented pressure uh, on the government of Iran to change its behavior. And so far, they've shown no indication they're prepared to do that. Uh, the president's made it clear repeatedly that he viewed the Iran nuclear deal as one of the worst in American diplomatic history. I thought he was right on target on that. We are not going to allow Iran to get nuclear weapons. All right, so how will the mullahs respond Will they try to restart the nuclear program? Joining me now, National Review senior editor and author of Suicide of the West. <laughs> it is Jonah Goldberg. Welcome back. Hey, it's great to be here. So a lot of people, uh, you know, when they look wistfully back at the Obama administration, they say this deal was the very best we could have hoped for. Do you believe that? No. I thought it was a terrible deal. I thought it was a deal to basically guarantee that Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon within 10 years and guarantee that it will have one after 10 years, um, which didn't seem like a great deal to me. It also, you know, part of the, the assumption behind the deal was that by giving them all of this money, uh, you know, these pallets of cash and all the rest, that they would use it to build up their infrastructure, their civil society, their repair their economy, and instead they use it to fund terror, to fund terrorist groups, to fund Hamas, mm -hmm. Hezbollah, uh, do, go to wars in, in places like Yemen and elsewhere. Um, and continue to sort of try to be a regional hegemon. So it backfired on its own terms, and it was never going to guarantee that they weren't going to get a nuclear weapon, which I thought was the point. All right, so let me ask you this in regards to sanctions, because there are competing schools of thought. There are some people who say that it doesn't matter what you do with sanctions, they don't work. And here you have some of the sanctions being listed, lifted and pallets of cash being sent over in exchange for hostages. And as you're proving right now, there's actually more civil unrest than there has been uh, since the Green Revolution. So I don't know how placing the sanctions back on that hot pot creates the ideal conditions for an effective uprising where people from within demand and receive the kind of necessary change so Iran can uh, participate fairly in a global economy. Yeah, look, uh, this is this is all high stakes stuff. I agree with that. Um, I think that the actual Iran deal was a bad deal on the merits. You can make the argument, you know, that, uh, you know, like they say in medicine, uh, you know, the cure for being stabbed in the chest isn't necessarily to pull the knife back out. Right. Um, that can make things actually worse. Uh, I, I think it's a legitimate argument to say that maybe we, sh you know, we should have let this thing run its course. We had allies all lined up. But that's not actually where I come down. I, I think that we should be leaning into this, that the idea of, uh, of fomenting the, the, the unrest in that country is in our interest. Uh, fomenting the overthrow of that government is in our interest. I don't want to send troops in to do it. Okay, but that, let me ask you then, how do we do it? Uh, because I agree with you, it's better for them, it's better for us, it's better for the world, it's better for peace if, in fact... Their government is overthrown. We don't want regime change. We don't want another theater opening in the Middle East. So what do you do and how do you do it other than wishing and hoping that well, look, people there have I, had I, enough? I, I do want regime change. I just don't want regime change at the point of one of our, gun, of our guns. Um, but I would love it if there was a revolution from within that overthrew you know, the mullahs and the Revolutionary Guard. I would love it if the people there got to have some sort of you know, democratic or at least popular uprising yeah. to let them get back on the path to a normal country. And I think one of the ways you do that is you undermine the legitimacy of the regime um, by not cooperating with them and basically giving them an economic lifeline to continue on the path 
of exporting revolutionary terror all around its neighborhood. If they had actually lived up to what the Obama administration said they were supposed to be doing with this deal and becoming yeah. a normal country, you wouldn't see runaway inflation in all of these protests. All right, so what have we learned not to do uh, in regards to North Korea from what's happening in Iran? I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, what, so what, are, things it, what are some of the lessons? Like, here's what not to do. And applying those lessons to North Korea, uh, meaning... Is it Im imperative that we do not ease up and allow uh, sanctions to be lifted and, again, an economic lifeline into North Korea? Is that what we've learned here? Well, um, you know, th th Iran and, and, and North Korea are very different countries. And, you know, th there may be different horses for different courses. But I'm all in favor of... Good rhymes. Of, uh, yeah, I'm all in favor of tightening the sanctions regimes against, against both countries. Um, the problem is, is that North Korea is essentially, um, it's a very narrow criminal regime at the very top. Mm -hmm. It's not a communist country. It's basically a divine right of kings yes. country or a divine right of Kim's country. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Iran has a much bigger, more robust civil society. It's got, there's a lot of people power on the ground that they're well, chanting. Well, you also have a lot of family members who live in the West and sure. go back and, and visit and share stories. And at some point, generationally, you're going to reach critical mass. And yeah. they, you know there are going to be more young people who want to engage in a free market economy. Uh, hopefully, we don't have to wait too long for that to happen. And, and if they didn't have a nuclear program, I would be perfectly happy of just waiting it out. But yeah. they do have a nuclear program, and I don't want the Ayatollahs to have nuclear weapons and become regional hegemons in the Middle East. And Hezbollah sucks. All right, Jonah, thank you so much. Thank you. The media whipped up into a foamy frenzy after the president's latest tweet on the Russia investigation. Yesterday, he tweeted, quote, fake news reporting, a complete fabrication that I am concerned about the meeting my wonderful son Donald had in Trump Tower. This was a meeting to get information on an opponent, totally legal and done all the time in politics. And it went nowhere. I did not know about it. President Trump's critics say he's again changing his story about the infamous meeting at Trump Tower between Donald Trump Jr. and a lawyer connected to the Kremlin. CNN is quoting anonymous sources, shocker, who claim that the president is concerned that his son could be in legal jeopardy. But the president's legal team and supporters claim the tweet proves nothing. The one thing that is clear, it's, there has been a lot of hay that's been made about this meeting, but will anything come of it? Let's go to tonight's panel. Mike Baker is here. He's a former CIA officer and president of Diligence, LLC, along with Democratic strategist Zach Pacanis and Reason.com associate editor. He's working on a brand new book, Robbie Suave in the house. Um, great to see you all. Good to be with you. Thank you. Uh, Baker, I will start with you. When does opposition research go too far? <clears throat> well, I mean, first of all, to answer that question, it is a very common uh, practice, right? So um, there's nothing unusual about meeting with individuals who claim that they have uh, dirt or leverageable information on your opponent. It's been going on forever. Have, have presidential campaigns been reaching into the caverns of people who live in other countries in order to get some of that information? Sure. Yeah. I mean, if they, and, 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 and let me give an example of that. Um, Russian intel uh, players were feeding uh, information to Christopher Steele, mm -hmm. who knew he was getting information, or should have known, from Russian intel sources. And they were, they were feeding this stuff to him, and he was feeding that to Fusion, and they were feeding it to the, the Clinton campaign. Mm -hmm. And they were all happy as pigs, right? They didn't care, because that's kind of what you do. I don't think they imagined that somehow this was going to blow up into a yeah. collusion issue. Look, I did this meeting in Trump Tower. Uh, I don't know what uh, Don Jr. knew about this meeting. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that they went into it believing that there was going to be some dirt, uh, possibly mm -hmm. leverageable information. And then it did morph into this uh, discussion about adoption, which has been an issue for Velikskaya, well, the, the, the Russian lawyer. I guess what's, what's so interesting is why does Russia have so much dirt? Is it because they're... But why does Russia have so much opposition research? Can I just step in there just for a second? Yeah. They don't. They, they don't have any more than the Chinese do. Or they don't have any more than the North Koreans I do. Mean, but they don't have well, any more than the we'll French see, do. We're hyper-focused yeah. on yeah. Russia. And, and there seems to be 
uh, a Russian funnel leading to both sides of the 2016. The concern here is not about the opposition research. The concern here is that Donald Trump was told that this meeting was part of a larger effort by the Russian government to help Donald Trump win the election. That is in the emails that he was forced to release. This is not about him Donald going Trump and Jr. trying to Donald Trump Jr. Yeah. This is not about him going and trying to get info, trying to get dirt. It is that this is part of a concerted effort. And what is concerning about this to people like me and others is that the Trump campaign was told in April that the Russians had stolen emails from Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. And instead of going to the police, what they did was they had a meeting with Trump, uh, with Kremlin operatives in Trump Tower. At the same time that this is going on, we have Roger Stone, a Trump associate, who is talking with the GRU, mm -hmm. which is the, with the front, which is Guccifer 2.0. They're talking with the Russian intelligence agency that actually stole the emails from the DNC yeah. and then released but, them. Uh, okay. and also, at, at the same time, I want to point something out quickly. You also have Harry Reid, who's talking, who's a Senate minority leader, talking with John Brennan, who's the head of the CIA, and yeah. they, they seem to be barking up the exact same tree. No, so, 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 so again, so, it's, so here it's a Russian dream. We got to first of all, you can't swing at that cat without hitting uh, a Kremlinologist or a, a, a an expert on Russian spying. I don't know what your operational background is, but but uh, I, I'm. Uh, this, that's an interesting point from my sake. Is we've created now a nation of of, of experts on Russian spying. Um, I think that that. Just reading his emails. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm just, I'm just reading, I'm just reading his emails. And yeah. I'm sorry, but Harry, but Harry Reid is a member of the Gang of Eight, and he is talking with our intelligence community about an active attack on the United States from a hostile foreign power that is entirely within his purview. And when we talk about what Christopher Steele was trying to do, he was a private investigator hired by the the campaign to try to find out. He was also how, working for the FBI. I, I mean, you I, don't no, think no, no, that's well, hold weird? On, but you're talking about a sequence of things where the he was hired because the campaign was very concerned that the Kremlin was concerned. working. The Kremlin was working to elect Donald Trump, and they were trying to figure so that out. So, Chris, hold on a second. Run, I got to bring, oh, I, I right. gotta bring no, Rob in here. Run, I, run, run. I, no, I do have to say, even though I <laughs> have I'm not seen the evidence there to suggest to, to, to prove the grand collusion narrative, yeah, and yeah. I'm not buying into it, uh, them giving sort of conflicting uh, accounts of, of why this meeting took place, I understand why that would inspire uh, uh, concern in people mm -hmm. who are looking to to connect the dots in places where I don't really see okay, it, but yeah, they have Don to get their Jr. story straight a little about, bit better. Lying about the timeline, that's problematic. That could be really stupid right. for him. He could be in trouble. And that could trouble, get him in trouble. It's not the crime, it's the cover-up. not the same exactly. thing right. as this massive conspiracy right, I agree. Exactly. that the, the left has been trying to paint the whole time. I, I agree it's not the same thing, but if this if this meeting was actually completely innocent and there was nothing untoward or illegal in what's going on. I don't think anything in presidential politics is completely innocent. No, 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 but, but, but <laughs> I, I agree, but why do you? I mean, let's remember that while this meeting was happening, the line from the Trump campaign is they didn't speak to Russians at all, ever. That, and that was a line that they kept for six months after that. And now, no, I think that was Claire McCaskill is, who said that. No, no, ma'am. No, ma'am. And, and actually, she in 18 actually months spoken ago, with the, line, the exact same Russians the, that Jeff Sessions the, had. You know, I, I, think, is, I think this is amazing, but, but I, I, I do think that I, I agree with you. I, from an operational perspective, that's all I can talk about. I don't know what was going on in these people's minds. Uh, I do understand operations and intelligence, uh, and I worked uh, the Russian target for a fairly long time. Uh, I'm not seeing this collusion thing, but Godspeed, go after it, keep keep going, dig down that rabbit hole, see what you can find. Mm, yeah, I, I think what it. we're going to end up is with with something that's not going to satisfy anybody. Neither All right, side well, is going to be happy. I, I need satisfaction, therefore yeah. i got to table this discussion for just a minute. We're going to see this man panel back in just a few minutes. However, former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort's trial, oh, it rolls on. Today, we got some crazy new twists. Now, remember... He was in Trump Tower in that Don Jr. meeting. Well, today, Manafort's right-hand man, the formerly bearded Rick Gates, testified against his mentor and even confessed to some mutual crimes. Fox Business Network's Edward Lawrence is in Washington with more. Edward. Well, Kennedy, a clean-shaven Gates testified. He's starting this week, uh, starting the trial with some fireworks. The prosecution put Paul Manafort's former friend and business associate, Rick Gates, on the stand. Now, Gates testified that he was involved in criminal activity related to money at the direction of Manafort. Now, in a telling exchange with the prosecutor, the prosecutor asked this, were you involved in criminal activity when you worked for Paul Manafort? The answer to that, Gates said yes. The follow-up question, did you commit a crime? The answer, yes. Gates testified that he lied to Manafort's bookkeeper and routinely arranged for wire transfers from an overseas bank that was not reported to the IRS. 
All of this uncovered during the Russia probe. Now, prosecutors say that Manafort made $60 million in lobbying work for a Russian-backed political group in the Ukraine. At the time, he did not register as a lobbyist for a foreign country or report a large percentage of that income. Now, Gates also admitted to embezzling money from Manafort to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. He served as Manafort's business partner for about a decade. He already cut a deal for his testimony with the special counsel, Robert Mueller. Gates pleaded guilty last February to conspiracy and lying to federal agents. The Manafort's defense building their case saying that Gates is the true man, uh, mastermind behind this and Manafort's only crime is placing trust in the wrong person. The defense saying that Gates got caught stealing from Manafort and would say anything to stay out of jail. Gates will be sentenced after this trial. Kennedy? No! Oh, the drama. It doesn't cease. Thank God. Edward Lawrence, thanks for being here. Exactly. All right, uh, coming up in just a little bit, President Trump continues his campaign against the media, what he calls fake news. But is the media feeding into all of this? Plus, are tech giants blocking conservative content from social networks? Look who it is, Antonio Sabato Jr. He is here. He knows a thing or two about left-wing bias. He joins me next. I like that you get to see the man panel is still here, just in case anything goes down. Baker's going to bust a cap in somewhere. President Trump ramped up his attacks on the media over the weekend in a series of tweets and statements like this one at a rally in Ohio. They're so dishonest. These are, these are among the most dishonest human beings you will ever meet. I feel bad for them. I do. Can you imagine covering presidential politics as your job? Yeah, it's pretty great. Uh, calling the media liars to their faces is par for the course with this president, but he dialed it up a notch all the way up to 11 on Sunday morning by tweeting, quote, the fake news hates me, saying that they are the enemy of the people only because they know it's true. I am providing a great service by explaining this to the American people. They purposely cause great division and distrust. They can also cause war. They are very dangerous and sick. That's fun. You know, I really wish he wouldn't hold back so much. The president's comments were met with howls of protest from members of what he would call the fake news media. But is that exactly what he's looking for when he picks on the press? Joining me now, California congressional candidate. He also knows a thing or two about acting. Antonio Sabato Jr. back on the program. Welcome back, Antonio. Hey, Kennedy. How are you? Very good. So, Thank you. Thank I, you for having me. I, I think the president is talking about specific people who editorialize and, and fan the flames and give in to his right. whims and are very reactionary. People like mm -hmm. Jim Acosta, who's super annoying and doesn't do anyone in the press any favors. But at the same time, there are a lot of pretty honest people out there who are just trying to report the news, which is weird. That's right, Kennedy. Listen, I have a message for the president. We have 90 days for election, November 6. Mr. President, I know you watch the show. I need you to come down to Ventura County so we can fight the media. You can land right here. We have a beautiful military base awesome. right here in Ventura County. Come down. I, I, I urge you to come down and help right. us out. California is part of the country. So we've got to fight this media. We've got to fight these socialists who are trying to destroy this country. Yes. And I'm doing just that. Okay. We have 90 days. Let's, let's take these things apart, though, Antonio, because I would love to see the president uh, on your behalf talk to the people of California because there are That's good, right. rational people left in the Golden State With who common can sense. think That's for themselves. Right. They are not victims exactly. of groupthink. They are not going to be forced into boxes and bubbles. Thank goodness. Right. They, there may be Thank fewer goodness. of them than there were 20 years ago, but they still exist. I think that would be great if the president were there. I think there are a lot of socialists yeah. who have no idea what they're talking about. They do not no understand idea. the consequences of their misguided words and thoughts. But at the same time, not everyone in the media is the devil. No, of course not. But uh, right now they're shutting us out in you know, social media. You know, if you're against them, if you're conservative, if you're, if you're actually for this president, like I was blacklisted from Hollywood. This is supposed to be people who are there to help the rest of the world. Peace. You know, we love everyone. Well, that's not the case. If you're conservative, they don't love you at all. They, they want to trash you. They want to trash your family. They want to put you down. We're not going to stand for that. We are putting America first and Americans in it first. And we've got to fight for that. And we have a, a huge election. And we've got to win this because it's at stake the future of this country. 
So, Antonio, is it true that after your 2016 endorsement of the president when he was still a candidate, you went back to Los yeah. Angeles and uh, were essentially abandoned by your management yeah. and agency? That's right. They all they all left me. You know, I've been I've been trying to survive. You know, I have p three beautiful kids. I'm trying to pay a mortgage and all that. And, and Hollywood has completely trashed me from day one since I supported this president. But I'm going to fight for that because we have a bigger task at hand, which is America and everyone who's in it. And uh, we have a lot of work to do. And I'm doing so much work for Ventura County. And uh, we're going to win this because it's uh, it's much more important than me and, and everything else. So, uh, all right. So what do you think about first. what do you think about Candace Owens and, and her fight with Twitter over the weekend being that's amazing banned it's for amazing. 12 hours because she was essentially taking some of the epithets that Sarah Jong, who's now part of the editorial board at the New York Times that she used and <laughs> replaced some of those words uh, against white people with blacks and Jews was kicked off that platform. That's right. I mean, this is this is socialism and this is uh, trying to control the entire country and especially from the media perspective and uh, we can't allow that to happen the germans did that very well and look what happened in world war two you know cuba castro did that very well and look what happened in every socialist countries that's what they're trying to do they they hate this president and everything that he stands for because they can't control him and you they think can't there's control a free press either. in north korea or venezuela or sweden <laughs> No. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, we have a real a big fight at hand, and uh, we've got to win this because America is uh, more important than anything at this point. Well, I'm, I'm glad you took the time. Good luck in your, uh, My your fight, the big election in the fall. Let us know if the president takes you up on your offer because, as you said, this is his I know favorite he will. program. All right. I know, I know that vote as well. Go, there. Go down to voteantonio.com, and thank you very much for watching. Vote early and often. Antonio, thank you so That's much. That's right. Very My good. pleasure. Thank you. Coming up, Medicare for All has become one of the left's big rallying cries ahead of the November midterm. I'll explain why Republicans need to come up with a winning counter message or risk getting wiped out by that dreaded blue wave. The monologue is next. Thank you. As we get closer to the midterms and the political rhetoric heats up like August asphalt, the trends of the November midterm start coming into focus. Democrats have had a hard time gaining traction merely resisting the president, but congressional Republicans left the door open just a crack on one issue for progressives to mercilessly exploit health care. For years, Republicans have been talking about repealing and replacing Obamacare, a complicated and cruel system that was rushed to passage. And now that they failed to realize a different vision, Democrats are seizing on the uncertainty by promising free stuff they'll never deliver. If Obamacare was Paris Hilton, Medicare for all, is the Kardashians, and it won't stop breeding bad ideas and zombie adherents. They all say single-payer insurance will cost a lot less than it does now. It won't happen, because it can't happen, and that damn math is an inconvenient roadblock to warm feelings. But snuggles and butterfly kisses won't cure cancer or pay the tax bill when a too-big-to-fail system fails utterly. Gubernatorial hopefuls in places like California, New York, and Colorado have paid tawdry lip service to these big government health plans because they sound sweet and guarantee idealistic votes. But they are unsustainable. Just ask Vermont, home state of that walking hobo cot, Bernie Sanders, why they discontinued the state's nearly $3 billion insurance plan. It's because their total state budget is just over $4 billion a year. Similar plans are stalled in legislatures from Cali to the Empire State, and Colorado voters screamed, hell no, when their $25 billion plan went on the ballot two years ago. There are never any parameters or safeguards to rein in spending for these freewheeling socialists who are unapologetic about robbing you and spending your hard-earned money. It's too bad Republicans screwed the pooch so badly when they had a chance to figure it out because now the Democratic dogma might have more bite than bark. Woof. And that's the memo. There are a number of primaries across the country tomorrow. And the midterms, just a few months away, at least a dozen Democrats running for governor this year, have pledged to bring universal health care in some form to their states. So why is this single-payer nightmare gaining so much traction on the left? Let me ask someone who's competing in a GOP primary for the U.S. Senate in Missouri tomorrow. He's also a former candidate for the Libertarian nomination for president in 2016. Austin Peterson is here. Welcome back, Austin. 
Nice to see you, Kennedy. Thanks for having me. So let's talk a little bit about this single-payer health care, because it's not just universal health care. It's single-payer, government-backed health care uh, in, in places like Colorado and New York and maybe even Missouri. What's pushing this trend? Well, everything's free under democratic socialism, except for the people. Uh, California tried to implement this. They had to drop it because they realized it was going to double their annual budget to $400 billion a year, and they couldn't afford it. Bernie Sanders' nightmarish fever dream that he wants to foist on the rest of us, they say, will cost $31 trillion over 10 years. Yikes. That's a big bite out of our budget. Even if we raised taxes, but if we doubled our taxes, the Wall Street Journal reports we still wouldn't be able to pay for these kinds of health care schemes. You know, the concern Conservative Republicans in Congress have been floating proposals that I think would really bust up the insurance cartels because, frankly, the problem is that we don't have competition in our health care system. No. But Rand Paul, who's an eye doctor, he knows for sure that we've had the quality come up and the cost come down because we haven't had third-party payers in our eye insurance market. There is no eye insurance market. So, frankly, if we had more free markets in our health care, if we had more competition, I think we'd see the cost come down and the quality would go up. Yes, if you had some people who just got catastrophic plans and other people who were actually shot for the plans they wanted with elements that they desired, you would certainly see costs come down. Uh, and, and that's the effective way to do it. And it's interesting because progressive act as though uh, profit is a four-letter word. When it's not, that's the thing that leads to innovation, which saves and prolongs people's lives. Uh, you know, in, in places like California and even New York, you do have stalled plans in the legislatures because, you know, one chamber says, oh, this is a great idea. We need to help everyone out. And the other actually pulls out a calculator and says, we can't do this. Because even if you have a 15 percent payroll tax increase, you are still hurting small business owners who are the ones who deserve more choice in economic mobility. I'm a small business owner. I have been victimized by Obamacare. I've had my health insurance canceled twice. I've been all over the state of Missouri in the last year, and people cannot afford these skyrocketing Are you gonna deductibles win tomorrow? or their, these premiums. Am I going to win? Well, actually, I'm the only Republican who's shown that they can beat Claire McCaskill. I'm the only Republican in a state where Trump won by 19 points who has a double-digit lead over Claire McCaskill. And you know why I beat her, Kennedy? Because when we did the poll, we found out that independents libertarians and yeah. even some democrats who like, care about civil liberties come over and vote for me in a general election claire mccaskill has been awful she's been all over the map and in many ways she has pledged her allegiance to the president which has to be very confusing for democratic voters in your state now you've you've been a libertarian in the past if this doesn't work out are you going back to the libertarian party I'm pro-life, pro-liberty, and pro-constitution. I'm the strongest Senate candidate against Claire McCaskill. As a constitutional a conservative, I will protect all question. of our freedoms all of the times. All right. Awesome. Well, no, I'm going to stick with the Republican Party because my people asked me to and because I believe it's the party of, of abolitionism and the party of freedom, and I will work so to make America will, free So you will again. not run for president on the libertarian ticket in 2020? No, I'll leave that to my betters. Who's that? Someone whose name rhymes with Rustin Skamash. <laughs> I do like Congressman Justin Amash. I think he does a great job in the, uh, in the House of Representatives. Okay. Austin oh, Peterson, right. okay. best of yeah. luck tomorrow. Let us know how you do. you got a lot of support out there. Thanks, Kennedy. Thanks very much. Well, there is a lot of concern that Russians will try to hack the midterm elections like they did in 2016, the bastards. Intel chiefs spoke at the White House last Thursday on how they're combating ongoing election interference. Yesterday, the top Democrat on the Senate Rules Committee, Amy Klobuchar, she said concerns about election security don't go far enough. She says they should be, quote, broadened out. So we start to discuss also the threats to our power grid system, the threats to our financial system, because the Russians aren't just stopping at the election equipment. We found out just last month that Russian agents had successfully hacked into some U.S. utilities in 2017 and could have caused widespread blackouts. So why didn't they? And how do we really protect our elections and our infrastructure? Joining me now, cybersecurity analyst and senior fellow at the Center for Digital Government, Morgan Wright is here. Welcome to the show, Morgan. Hi, Kennedy. So what is most pressing here? Is it safeguarding our voting machines? Or is there some grander conspiracy to paralyze the United States by attacking our grid network? 
You know, look, the Russians, are uh, they don't back Trump, they don't back Clinton, they back chaos. So they will do anything that creates division. And I'm less concerned about the actual voting machines uh, being impacted. There's a lot of good work out there being done through DHS called the Elections Infrastructure Information Sharing Analysis Center. It's a mouthful, but you, 800 counties, 50 states are all part of it. Do you it. think the government has done a bad job of highlighting ways that they have enhanced cybersecurity? I think they they are not a the U.S. federal government gets a D for marketing. They have not done a good job talking about how they actually have gone out to protect stuff. The multi-state ISAC, the elections infrastructure, all very good programs that DHS is running that I'm surprised a lot of counties don't know about. And these these are free resources. They don't cost the states or counties anything to protect. But you know the hack the infrastructure is one piece. The influence operations to influence our elections mm -hmm. that's a whole nother piece. And that's where the federal government really has dropped the ball until recently and they've actually had to have Facebook show them how to do it uh, in the digital media space. Yeah, but you do, uh, you sort of slide down a slippery First Amendment slope. Uh, I understand that, but there also has not been a, a correlation made, a direct correlation made between Russians who bought, you know, $10,000 in right. Facebook ads and people actually changing their vote. And yeah. I don't know how you figure that out. I don't know what the algorithm is. I just know no one's invented it yet. Uh, I don't think a single vote was changed because of it, but it did cause it did cause problems. Look, for example, in India, over 70 people have been killed simply because of rumors on Instagram that certain men are pedophiles or sexual offenders. You know, this type of disinformation can have a bad effect. It's been used to great effect to cause division, mm -hmm. and it's a huge influence operation. Well, I think there are also a lot of other countries who are looking at this, and it's not just Russia. And, now, and you know, they also see perhaps how easy it is to create political discord, but I think the fact that we have these conversations where we can disagree actually shows that we're stronger and better than everyone else. Well, look, there was an old uh, Supreme Court justice who said sunlight is the best disinfectant and electrical light is the best policeman. Shedding awareness of this, creating that transparency, showing people, hey, you can't, you can't change people's mind, but you can give them a new set of facts on which to base that on. Look, as long as we've got, as long as the government continues to put information mm -hmm. out, uh, you've got companies like Facebook that are, are, that are trying better. You've got these new free resources from DHS. Look, yep. all we can do is all we can do, but all people have to take advantage of it. All we can do, Morgan, thank yes, you so much for your time. Appreciate it. You bet, Kennedy. Very good. Coming up, dozens shot across Chicago on one of the city's bloodiest weekends in recent history. So what is causing such senseless violence and who is really to blame? The panel returns to discuss. They got answers. They're after the break. At least 66 people were shot, 12 of them fatally, during a violent outbreak in Chicago this past weekend. The city's Democratic mayor, Rahm Emanuel, who's running for a third term, blamed the number of guns on the street and said the violence should not be a reflection of the city. Watch. We have a heavy heart. Our souls are burdened. What happened this weekend did not happen in every neighborhood in Chicago. It, but it is unacceptable to happen in any neighborhood of Chicago. We are a better city. But according to the Chicago Tribune, 1,700 people have been shot in the Windy City this year alone. So is the mayor to blame, and what can be done to stop the violence? The panel is back. Mike Baker, Zach Bacanis, and Robbie Suave. Uh, I have a feeling you're all going to have a different uh, place you come from on this. So I'm going to start with you, Robbie. What is the root cause of this violence, particularly in a place like Chicago? All of this violence is gang violence, and the gang activity is primarily related to the black market drug trade. I have a crazy solution. Can we try this finally? Um, legalize drugs or decriminalize drugs. Uh, that would take away what these gangs are fighting over, right? Nobody, there's no alcohol gangs killing each other anymore. That was only during Prohibition when it was illegal. Um, the murder this rate would, doubled over a 13-year period. Right. This would uh, take this would this would take the the drug market out of the black market. They there wouldn't have this uh, financial incentive to kill each other. Um, you would solve more of the homicides because they wouldn't be related to, to drug deaths are the hardest homicides to solve. So the police would solve more homicides, and that would discourage people from from committing violent crimes. Because if you think you're going to get away with it, or that no one's going to solve your murder, you're more likely to commit violence. The studies have shown. But you say it's guns. I mean, it's definitely guns. I mean, look, we have this patchwork of gun safety uh, laws that go from state to state. So you have a state like Illinois, which has very strong gun control measures, but it's surrounded by states with very weak ones. Sixty percent of the guns that were uh, that go into this go uh, that were 
uh, looked at in a, in a recent study actually came from out of state. Mm -hmm. Only 40 percent came from. How many of them with, came from Illinois. the black market? A, a, a huge number of them. And this is this is the problem. There so are just more, too more gun many. prohibition. Right. It, it doesn't touch the black market, and and that's a problem but, with. I mean, when you talk about true. prohibition, when you talk about prohibition of drugs, when you talk about prohibition yeah. of guns. That's when you get violent. When you, when you can go, actually. when you can go into Illinois and you can go to a gun show where you don't have to get a background check, you and really then you take that gun that and then you go to Indi Indiana, who are but killing like each other this. and firing in the crowds indiscriminately are going to gun shows. Yes, that is not true. It, it, it is actually true. That it's is how, a false. No, and it's and it's how the guns Look are actually getting. Study. It's actually how the go guns are getting Jacob in there. Go read some Jacob All right. Well, first of all, I'm shocked that uh, the response would be uh, we need more gun control. Um, I'm not shocked. But I, I, I don't disagree with the drugs as an element of it. I think a, a broader picture, and how do you solve this? I have no idea. It's way above my pay grade, is uh, lack of opportunity, right, for, that, for that, those communities that exist there. Uh, a, a fundamental way to solve or to start to resolve some of the issue, it's not going to resolve everything. We've got, I th there's elements of all of what we're talking about here that actually make up the truth, uh, is you need more community policing. Um, you know, studies, you can pull them all out all day long, but studies show more community policing will assist this problem, won't make it go away, yeah. but it is a function, but they need more money, they need more uh, resources and manpower. Uh, that's probably not going to happen in Chicago. It's not going to happen because you've got corrupt unions essentially running and bankrupting the states. Uh, but, you know, there, there are these structural causes and that, bad police can be worse yeah uh, because then they inflame the tensions even if you have more police and they're not well trained you can make the you can make the problem and, uh, and then yeah, and yeah, then yeah, the people wanna, you know, they interface yeah, with yeah. go into the system for drugs or for whatever reason and then you have generations of people who are essentially robbed of fathers who just you know tend to repeat the same mistakes over and over again but it's been years we've been lamenting this, this it seems like it surfaces right it, it, it just like because of this weekend and and we lament it for a little while and then like uh, you know raccoons chasing the shiny object you know we and the media go focusing on something else. Yeah, well, you know, this many deaths, this much bloodshed, it is tragic. If this all happened in one place, it's all we would be talking about. But for every single person who had a family member who was shot or killed, that is devastating. And that pain doesn't leave them just as it hasn't in any mass shooting event. Uh, thank you all for being here. We'll be right back. Two elderly men wandered out of a German nursing home and were found at a nearby heavy metal festival. Police say they were in a disoriented and dazed state. So in other words, just like everyone else in the crowd, throw out the horns and sell your soul. This is the Topical Storm. Topic number one. We begin tonight in Michigan, where the Uber taxis have plenty of horsepower. Hey, nice rump. This guy's name is Timothy, and he has started what he calls an Amish Uber service. It's just like sitting in the back of a regular Uber, except that you get kicked by a horse instead of a human. Rides begin at $5, and the good news is Amish Uber doesn't charge surge pricing. The bad news is they definitely don't have an app. Tim's business models are quick to point out. He's got business models. He doesn't have time to pick up as many passengers as he'd like, but think of all the money he saves on gas. Amish Uber gets about 12 miles to the hay bale. Try topping that in your Prius, you virtue signaling blowhard. Mm. Topic number two. That was my impression of a virtue signaling blowhard. <laughs> All right. A Brooklyn salon is going viral tonight because of their eyebrow waxes. Shut it, okay? Nothing's happening to these. Which are a big hit with customers. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I think that's illegal. This is not a hazing ritual to join a secret society of nailed techs. This is the salon manager who lives by the motto, the customer is always bruised. The dust-up started after a woman reportedly refused to pay for a $5 eyebrow wax. She claimed it was all messed up. Well, if she thinks the waxing was no good, she should see what they did to a lady who wouldn't pay a, for a $30 pedicure. God rest her soul. And the soul of her little feet. Over 2 million people have watched the video of the Nail Salon Slugfest. And despite all of the negative press, the salon is still beating the competition. <laughs> Literally. That hurts. <laughs> Topic number three. 
Well, nobody had a crazier weekend than a Michigan cop who led his own partners on a wild goose chase. Sergeant Eric Lefebvre was patrolling the mean streets of Escanaba when this Canada goose began following him like a real creep. We know the goose is Canadian because it kept apologizing the whole time for being so close. It's unclear. Sorry, eh? Yeah, I know I'm right next to you, eh? It is unclear what would possess it to follow a cop, but given the drug problems in Escanaba, animal experts feel that it could have been smoking quack. hey -o. Oh, man, I can hear you tweeting at me right now. Kennedy, that last joke was ducking terrible. Hey, topic number four. Let's head out to Auburn, Washington, where the horse racing fans made a killing this weekend by betting on the underdog. Oh, listen to that squealing. It is the annual corgi race is taking place every year at beautiful Emerald Downs. It's a lot like the Kentucky Derby, except the winner doesn't go out to stud because he's been neutered. Talk about a fixed race. Mm. The corgis are so popular that a group of women are now asking to have a cat race next year. In fact, experts already have a word for women who would attend a cat race. They're called single. 5,000 people attended this year's event, which was not without controversy. Turns out the final race ended in a photo finish, and several people disagreed with the results and now are refusing to pay their bookie. At first glance, I thought this was a video of one of our staff meetings, but now I looked closer, I realized that that's a broomstick and not a whiffle ball bat. Get over here! Nah! We'll be right back. They dared me to whistle because I love whistling. Thank you so much for watching the best hour of your day. Please follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Kennedy Nation on Facebook. It's Kennedy FBN. Email Kennedy FBN at foxbusiness.com. Tomorrow night on the show, California Congressman Dana Rohrbacher is here along with Steve Hilton and Tom Shalhoub. Tom Shalhoub, how do you do? How about you? Good night. <laughs>